today's story will take us to the Western theater of the Civil War and will focus on the campaign that made victory in that theater possible and brought Ulysses S. Grant his first taste of notoriety. The Western theater included seven of the 11 states in rebellion, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, as well as the states of Kentucky and Missouri, which remained loyal to the United States, but were strategically important to both sides of the conflict. The geography faced by the Western campaigners was quite different from that of their counterparts in the East. In the West, roads were poorer, railroads were fewer, and much of the countryside was untamed. To add to these hazards, the Western theater dwarfed the East in terms of square mileage. The West comprised some 385,000 square miles of potential battleground, compared to around 95,000 miles in the East. For the Union, the Western theater was divided into two main departments, the Department of the Missouri and the Department of the Ohio. The Confederacy had one unified Department too. In the fall of 1861, the Department of the Missouri was commanded by Major General Henry Halleck. Halleck replaced John C. Fremont in November of 1861. The Department of the Missouri was headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri at that time, and the objective was to infiltrate the Western states. On the other side, you had Department Two, commanded by Major General Albert Sidney Johnston. Johnston was the highest ranking officer in the United States Army before the war, and he became the highest ranking officer in the Confederate Army when he defected. Department Two was headquartered in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and their objective was obviously to defend the borders into the South. Part of the strategy for both sides was uh, to control rivers because they were major arteries into the rebelling states. Waterways were vital to transportation and communication at that time. If you think about it, major cities were located along rivers and other bodies of water and would be extremely vulnerable to the military forces who had control of those waterways. This was why the United States strategy to win the war depended on controlling access to the rebelling ports and rivers. The Anaconda Plan was the name given to the United States military strategy to suppress the rebellion. It included blockading ports and to split the Confederacy in two by gaining full control of the Mississippi River, thereby guaranteeing military access to the area that was in rebellion. The strategic control of rivers was a particular concern in Tennessee, which was at the northern end of the rebellion. Tennessee was the last state to announce its intention to secede from the United States in June of 1861. Tennessee was the last state to announce, um, I'm sorry, uh, but even before the state government rebelled against the United States, it was clear that things were moving in that direction. And officials in Tennessee began to survey the state's rivers and fortification sites as early as May. In addition to the Mississippi, the two rivers that were of particular concern were the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers. The Tennessee River is the largest tributary of the Ohio River. It flows about 652 miles from Paducah, Kentucky to near Knoxville, Tennessee. It's the river that you see flowing south and then going north, slightly lighter blue. It passes through the Tennessee-Mississippi border, reaching Mosul Shoals in uh, northern Alabama and through the city of Chattanooga in eastern Tennessee. The Cumberland River, which is the one darker blue in the, uh, to the north of that, flows about 688 miles from the Appalachian Mountains down into northern Tennessee and then to the Ohio River near Paducah, Kentucky. It passes through the cities of Nashville and Clarksville in Tennessee, which were pretty important cities and high priorities for the Confederacy. At the time our story begins, Ulysses S. Grant was a Brigadier General in the Department of the Missouri. By the fall of 1861, Grant had been appointed commander of the District of Southeastern Missouri by Major General John C. Fremont. When Fremont was replaced by Henry Halleck in early 18, uh, November of 1861, Halleck immediately disliked Grant. 
judging him on stories of his alcoholism from his time in the military before the war and rumors that he had fallen off the wagon. Halleck really disliked and distrusted Grant. In early November, 1861, Grant led troops in the Battle of Belmont in Missouri, which was the first large military engagement Grant and his men were a part of. The battle pitted a little more than 3,000 Union soldiers against approximately 5,000 troops under Major General Leonidas Polk. Grant's forces attacked the Confederate camp at Belmont in the early morning hours of November 7th, and despite early success, were forced to retreat in the afternoon. The result was a defeat for the inexperienced Union troops, which suffered about 607 casualties, including 120 that were killed. That, that was pretty equally matched on the other side, uh, where there were about 641 casualties, including 105 who lost their lives. Here you can see a map showing the major forces in the Western Theater at the end of 1861. The defeat at Belmont meant that the Union was blocked at the Mississippi River from Columbus, Kentucky south. As you can see in this close-up of the map, Belmont, Missouri and Columbus, Kentucky were located directly across from each other, with Polk's forces concentrated on the eastern side. In late December, Grant was appointed head of the new district of Cairo, which included the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers in northern Tennessee. A month later, in late January 1862, Grant presented a plan to Henry Halleck that would involve bypassing Columbus and moving along the Tennessee River to attack Fort Henry. Halleck denied permission, believing Grant was overstepping and making it clear to him who was in charge. Once Grant and Flag Officer Andrew Hall Foote approached Halleck together, he granted permission for a joint Army-Navy attack on Fort Henry. Though the permission was specific to Fort Henry, Fort Donelson always factored into Grant's plans. The dangers to Fort Henry and its partner on the Cumberland River, Fort Donelson, were known from the beginning. Several months before the battle, Southern newspapers were reporting about the imminent threats to the fortifications. As early as the fall of 1861, newspapers were full of false stories about, quote, Lincolnite troops being captured along the banks in the vicinity of the forts. There were also sightings of Union gunboats near Fort Donelson at that time, since the Navy did some reconnaissance to determine the defenses along the river. There were also many editorials in Southern newspapers about why the forts needed to be immediately reinforced, particularly because of the, quote, spies and traitors in Tennessee who would be willing to help federal troops. At this time, Fort Donaldson's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Randall McGavick, recruited new regiments from the local men around the fort. This was all happening before there were any real imminent threats to the fortifications, but it was pretty clear that it was just a matter of time before the danger would be immediate. By the time Grant and Foote were actually preparing for the attack, Southern newspapers were reporting that an attack was unlikely. As seen on the right, the Athens Post of Athens, Tennessee reported on why the attack could not happen on the very day that Union troops were preparing for the campaign. Citing the late rains and the high level of the river, the paper basically stated that a successful attack was impossible. This was written in spite of demonstrations against Fort Henry just a few days earlier. Uh, this map shows the portions, uh, positions of the opposing forces as the campaign for the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers began. You had Henry Halleck in St. Louis, Albert Sidney Johnston in Bowling Green, Grant and Foote in Cairo, Illinois, and then the objectives for Henry and Donaldson were just across the Kentucky-Tennessee border. On the Union side, in addition to Grant, these were the men who would play an important role in this campaign. There was Charles Smith. Charles Smith was a former instructor at West Point who taught many of the men who served as officers during the Civil War, including Grant. He was a veteran of the Mexican-American War and served with Albert Sidney Johnston in Utah in the years leading up to the Civil War. Many people thought that Smith and not Grant should have been in command in Cairo at this time. That Smith was very loyal to Grant. 
You also had Lou Wallace. Wallace was a lawyer from Indiana who joined the Republican Party and embarked on a full-time military career when the war began. He recruited the 11th Indiana Volunteer Infantry in April 1861 and was commissioned a colonel. He was promoted to Brigadier General in September 1861 and was moved to the Western Theater. He also had John McClernand. McClernand was a politician with very little military experience except for serving briefly during the Black Hawk War. He was commissioned a Brigadier General under Grant, who appointed him to lead the 1st Division, which, as we will discuss, led in the advances of Fort Henry and Donaldson. And then you have Andrew Hallfoot, who's a very interesting person. He traveled all around the world during his time with the Navy and circumnavigated the globe in 1837. He was an advocate for temperance and is credited by many historians as the driving force behind the elimination of the spirit ration by the Navy in 1862. So you can imagine how popular that decision must have been. He established a good relationship with Grant, who was his army counterpart, uh, as they both preferred to go on the offensive. He was instrumental in convincing Halleck to approve Grant's plan to, uh, to attack Fort Henry. The men you see here were the main players for the rebel side of the story. So you have Gideon Pillow, Pillow didn't have a great reputation. He was known, known as a braggart and exaggerator. He was good friends with Andrew Jackson and James K. Polk and was appointed a Brigadier General by Polk during the Mexican-American War. He was hated by Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott. And Winfield Scott actually became a, a lifelong enemy of his. When the Civil War began, Pillow eventually became a Brigadier General and was instrumental in the efforts to fortify the important river system in the South. Fort Pillow was built and named after him. And you may be familiar with Fort Pillow as the site of the slaughter of over 300 African American men and women by forces under Nathan Bedford Forrest in 1864. The terrible story. He and Grant first faced each other at the Battle of Belmont in November of 1861. You also have Simon Bolivar Buckner. Buckner was a career military man. He was a graduate of West Point and a veteran of the Mexican-American War. He was a friend of Ulysses S. Grant's and helped Grant financially before the war. When the war began, Buckner helped organize the Kentucky State Guard and was appointed, appointed adjutant general. He later accepted a commission as a brigadier general with the Confederate Army in department number two. He had been a friend and supporter of Winfield Scott and he really disliked Gideon Pillow who was unfortunately his superior at Fort Donaldson. You also have John B. Floyd. Floyd had been governor of Virginia in the 1850s, at which time he was an active proponent of the terrible fugitive slave law. He served as Secretary of War under President Buchanan and was accused of sending large stores of arms to armories in the South in anticipation of civil war. Eventually, uh, he became a Brigadier General in the Confederate Army and served in Virginia until being sent west in January of 1862 at which time Albert Sidney Johnston placed him in command at Fort Donaldson over more experienced generals like P.G.D. Beauregard and William Pardee. And then you have Nathan Bedford Forrest. Forrest was a wealthy slave trader and Memphis alderman prior to the war. By 1860, he owned two cotton plantations and had established himself among the wealthiest men uh, in Tennessee, all based on slave labor. With the start of the Civil War, Forrest enlisted as a private in the Tennessee Mounted Rifles and helped equip the unit using his own money. Despite having no formal military training, Forrest was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and was placed in charge of raising and training his own battalion of 650 mounted troops. He was in command of the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry and sent to reinforce Fort Donaldson once the danger was imminent. The other important players in this story were the ironclads. The Union Navy commissioned seven ironclads in August of 1861, and they were each named for towns on the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. You had the USS Carondelet, St. Louis, Cairo, Pittsburgh, Mount City, Cincinnati, and Louisville. These ships had 13 guns each and were protected by their thick armored plates and low profile. They were in service in Western waters by January 1862 and formed the backbone of the Union's river forces. 
the Ironclads, Carondelet, Essex, Cincinnati, and St. Louis, and the Timberclads, Conestoga, Lexington, and Tyler will all factor into this campaign. You can see an illustration of Fort Henry here. Fort Henry was named for Tennessee's Senator Gustavus Henry Sr. He was the senator for the state in rebellion. It was located at a critically important point to defend strategic points for the uh, Confederacy. It was built on a floodplain on the Tennessee River. There were better sites on the Kentucky side, but that uh, was outside the original parameters since Kentucky remained neutral in the early part of the, of the war when the, these forts were actually being constructed. By the time Confederate military engineers inspected the site in the fall of 1861 and deemed it unacceptable, its construction was too far advanced to be abandoned. As a result of the weaknesses at Fort Henry, Confederates began construction on Fort Hyman on the bluffs across the river. Fort Hyman was still under construction at the time of the attack on Fort Henry. On February 2nd, 1862, Grant and Foote moved south on the Tennessee towards Fort Henry. They had more than 15,000 men from 23 regiments. They also had seven gunboats, four ironclads and three timberclads. Fortunately, the high water levels on the Tennessee River allowed their ships to avoid underwater mines, which were scattered throughout the river. At the time of the attack, Brigadier General Lloyd Tillman was in command of Forts Henry and Hyman. Tillman noticed the smoke from the gunboats from miles away and became aware of Union forces closing in. He found himself in a difficult position with less than 3,000 men in Forts Henry and Hyman combined. As this was occurring, the water was rising at Fort Henry and it was flooded. Before the attack began, Tillman had the men from Fort Hyman moved across the river and had most of the men from both garrisons stationed outside of Fort Henry in preparation to move to Fort Donelson. He retained just enough men to operate the heavy guns at Fort Henry. The Union plan called for a coordinated attack with both the Army and Navy. Grant had General Charles F. Smith's division attack Fort Hyman and John McClernand's division move along the eastern back of Fort Henry. When Foote arrived with the iron and timber clads, he found Confederate deforce, defenses lacking and he decided to act. With the river flooded, Foote sailed straight into a chute around Panther Island, which you see there on the north, or at the top of the screen, which was just north of the fort where he had a position to get close to Port Henry without being able to be fired upon by its guns. The Union Navy hit seven of the 11 heavy guns at Port Henry, with one of the guns exploding and killing the crew. The Essex and Cincinnati were damaged. The Cincinnati was unable to participate in the Battle of Fort Donelson, and many of the sailors died on the Essex. The Union Army was delayed by swollen streams and muddy roads and did not take part in the attack. Much of the weaponry at Fort Henry was outdated at this time. Recognizing that further resistance was pointless, Tillman told his men he would try to hold out for an hour to allow most of them to escape to, escape to Fort Donaldson while he raised, before he raised the white flag. Twelve officers, including Tillman and 82 enlisted men, surrendered. There really wasn't a question of the outcome. Union forces were about 15,000 strong with seven ships, and the Confederates had about 2,600 troops and a partially flooded fort. The battle resulted in, in relatively few casualties. There was 40 on the United States side and 79 on the rebel side. But it was a shock for the unexperienced Union men to see the bodies of the Confederates at the fort who had died. Foote returned to Cairo following the battle, taking three of the ironclads with him for repairs. Only the USS Carondelet remained. In his after-action report, Lloyd Tillman described Fort Henry as a, quote, wretched military position and said that, quote, the history of military engineering records no parallel to this case. Interestingly, within two days of the battle, Fort Henry was completely underwater, meaning that the battle would never have taken place if United States troops had waited to attack. 
The immediate result of the victory was that Union troops could move down the Tennessee River and destroy bridges and links of communication that were used by the Confederates. Fort Foote sent the three timberclads on a mission to destroy valuable military installations and supplies. The raid destroyed a significant bridge on the Memphis and Ohio River that connected Bowling Green to Memphis and Western Tennessee. News of the fall of Fort Henry was reported almost immediately in newspapers with a focus for Southern newspapers on the defense at Fort Donelson. Lincoln was particularly pleased with the victory. Grant used this victory as an opportunity to inform Halleck that he could now move on Fort Donelson in the coming days, which hadn't been part of what was, he was originally approved to do. As I mentioned earlier, most of the troops from Forts Henry and Hyman escaped to Fort Donelson on the day of the attack. After their victory, Union forces scattered the area and obtained good information about road conditions between the two forts. Grant accompanied one of the patrols and rode to within sight of Fort Donaldson, obtaining valuable information about the lay of the land before he decided to attack. Despite the victory, Henry Halleck was concerned that Grant's position was not as strong as it seemed, and he sent more reinforcements. Fort Donaldson was named after Confederate General Daniel Donaldson. It was an earthen fort, uh, which is a field fortification, usually shaped like a mound or a ditch, it also has a parapet and was constructed from, from dirt, from the earth. It was more heavily fortified than Fort Henry had been and was reinforced in anticipation of the battle. At this time, Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnson was still at Bowling Green and was being threatened by Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio to the north of the city. Johnson feared that if Fort Donaldson fell, Grant could bring his army up the river and trap him. He decided to reinforce Fort Donaldson and retreat with his army to Nashville. He sent 12,000 men, including Generals John B. Floyd, Gideon Pillow, and Simon Bolivar Buckner to Fort Donaldson with orders to defend the fort and then move their forces to join Johnston in Nashville. In preparation for the attack, the Confederates mounted heavy guns on the water batteries, they built and extended earthworks, and cut trees to open fields of fire, but they didn't make any effort to stop Grant as he prepared to move against Fort Donaldson. Grant's forces moved out of Fort Henry on February 11th, making the 12-mile march to Fort Donaldson. One brigade under the command of Lew Wallace was left to defend Fort Henry. Grant sent some regiments by water. The weather was so balmy that during the march, the Union troops began to drop their coats and blankets along the route. They cut telegraph wires to Fort Donaldson, which made it difficult for Southern newspapers to gain information on the particulars of the battle, other than vague reports of firing upon the fort. This was in contrast to Northern newspapers that were reporting daily movements and were kept up to date of the outcomes. Here you can see Fort Donaldson and notice the series of fortifications that were built to defend it. The fort stood on high, dry ground and had miles of protective trenches built around it. The main fort and water batteries are here on the right near the river, and the defensive earthworks are shown around the perimeter. You can see that the town of Dover is uh, within the uh, protective, um, protective enclosure of the earthworks. Grant realized that Fort Donaldson would be much more difficult to defeat than Fort Henry had been, but he benefited from an understanding uh, that the second of command at, at Fort Donaldson, Gideon Pillow, uh, wasn't a, a very strong general. Grant judged Pillow that he knew that any force under Pillow, no matter how small, could march up to within gunshot of the entrenchments that he was holding. So he knew that Gideon really, Gideon Pillow really couldn't do the job that he needed to do. McClernand and Smith's division arrived on February 12th. McClernand took position on the right, while Smith's divisions occupied the left along the heights. Union troops continued to position themselves around the forts throughout the following day. By this time, Fort Donaldson's reinforcements had arrived, bringing the Confederate total to about 16,000 troops. With news of the size of Confederate forces, Grant called Lew Wallace from Fort Henry. 
When Wallace arrived, Union forces numbered approximately 27,000 men surrounding Fort Donelson on all sides. Confederate Commander Floyd arrived just as Union forces were arriving. As you'll recall, Floyd had limited military experience, so he really deferred to his subordinates like Gideon Pillow and Simon Bolivar Buckner. Nathan Bedford Forrest distinguished himself early on in the battle when his cavalry captured a Union artillery battery and he broke out of a Union Army siege headed by Grant on February 13th. That night, the temperature dropped dramatically, reaching below freezing conditions. As you'll recall, many Union men had dropped their blankets and overcoats during the march when the weather was warm. The storm and with high winds deposited three inches of snow the following morning. As they were positioned so close to the enemy, Union troops were unable to light fires and were absolutely miserable all night. By the next morning, guns and wagons were frozen to the ground. Despite the changes in the weather, the battle continued. Grant hoped the gunboats would be as successful as they had been at Fort Henry. The USS Crondelet, which was the only gunboat that had remained in the area after the fall of Fort Henry, arrived first and attacked, hitting and dismounting one of the heavy guns on Fort Donaldson's water battery. The remainder of the ironclads and timberclads arrived on February 14th and moved into formation. Confederate batteries were ready and opened fire. Fort Donaldson was on much higher ground than Fort Henry and easier to defend. Union gunboats had to elevate their guns while Confederate guns were shooting downward. A solid shot hit the USS St. Louis, killing the pilot, damaging the wheel, and wounding flag officer foot, causing the ship to fall back. The USS Pittsburgh was hit by two rounds that penetrated through the iron to the wooden hull, causing the ship to take on water. The Louisville had also been uh, forced to retreat after sustaining damage, and eventually the Crom Delay was forced to move back. The ironclad attack failed. The Confederate batteries had successfully defended the fort, and Grant was shocked. Confederate generals realized that despite their victory on the water, they were still surrounded by the Union, Union Army and needed a plan. The decision was made to break out to allow as many troops as possible to escape the fort. The breakout plan was called for Pillow's division to lead an attack against the Union right under McClernand, as you can see here on the bottom of the map. Once the Union's division was moved back, it would then be attacked by Buckner's forces, which would leave the road open to Nashville. On the morning of the 15th, Pillow led the attack against McClernand's division as planned. Grant was seven miles downstream inspecting the damage to the gunboats. Lou Wallace at the Union Center and Charles Smith on the Union left both came to McClernand's aid. The Union line was pushed back, leaving the road open for the Confederates to escape. Buckner wanted to take advantage of their improved position, but Pillow inexplicably ordered Confederate forces to return to the fort and sent a telegram to Johnston in Nashville to tell him that the day was won. Buckner questioned the order, but Floyd, who was ultimately in command, sided with Pillow. As the Confederates argued, Grant returned and reorganized his troops. He noticed that captured Confederate soldiers were carrying enough rations and supplies to last for a few days, and realized that the, the attack was an escape attempt and not an effort to protect the fort. So he ordered McClernand and Wallace to retake the ground that was lost in the morning and ordered Smith to attack the Confederate right. Smith moved his forces down the ridge and was positioned for battle at the bottom of the Confederate occupied hill. His forces met very little resistance and they easily captured the earthworks pushing the Confederates back. Confederates lost the land they had gained in the morning and as well as their opportunity to escape. We have in the Shrine's collections uh, an after action memorandum that was written by John McClernand on the 15th, where he detailed the Union reaction during the uh, Confederate breakout attempt, which you can see part of here on the screen. On the night of the 15th, while McClernand was writing his memorandum, Confederate commanders met at the Rice House in Dover. They had conflicting reports about how many men Grant had and how much ground was gained in the afternoon. 
Floyd was concerned that he would be tried for treason if he escaped, and he turned over command to Pillow and decided to escape. Pillow, believing himself to be a valuable prize for the Union, then put Buckner in charge and also planned to escape across the Cumberland River with some men. With surgeons advising against moving the sick and wounded in the cold weather, Buckner realized that there weren't any other options other than to surrender the fort. Disgusted at the show of cowardice, furious Nathan Bedford Forrest announced that he would not surrender his command, and he escaped with about 4,000 troops across nearby Lick Creek, which is what you see in this illustration. On the morning of February 16th, Buckner sent the note you see here to ask Grant for his terms of surrender. As I mentioned earlier, Grant and Buckner knew each other. They were at West Point together and Buckner helped Grant when he was destitute in the years prior to the war. In his response, Grant famously replied, quote, no terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Left with no, no other option, Buckner responded that the quote, overwhelming forces under your command compel me to accept the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms. The surrender took place at the Dover Hotel, which was Buckner's headquarters. You can see that picture on the screen. Grant and Buckner's meeting was actually friendly. Grant asked Buckner why Pillow decided to flee and Buckner replied, quote, well, he thought you would rather have hold of him than any other man in the Southern Confederacy. To which Grant replied, quote, oh no, if I had got him, I'd let him go again. He would do us more good commanding you fellows. Buckner surrendered the fort and nearly 13,000 men, including himself, becoming the first Confederate general to surrender an army. Grant showed the prisoners mercy offering Buckner money and ensuring that the enlisted men were fed and allowed to keep their sidearms. With the large number surrendered, the combined casualty count was high for the Confederate side. Many of the deaths on both sides were due to uh, exposure from the cold weather. Northern newspapers immediately reported the victory, writing, as you can see here, that, quote, the disgrace of Bull Run was wiped out at Fort Donelson by the Western boys. In Detroit, newspapers stated, the news of the victory at Fort Donelson causes indescribable joy here. 100 guns were fired on the receipt of the news and tonight buildings are illuminated. The fire department, military and citizens are out in grand procession with banners, torches and rockets celebrating the great event. In Columbus, the news from Donaldson is received here with great enthusiasm. A national salute was fired, the bells were rung, and tonight bonfires are blazing. The state house is brilliantly illuminated, also several private dwellings. In Boston, the news of the capture at Fort Donaldson created a perfect furor of patriotic jubilation in Boston today. There never has been so much joy manifested. And in Baltimore, the Union men are overflowing with joy. The news is nowhere more acceptable than to them. The secesh are overwhelmed with this Waterloo defeat. It took, took Southern newspapers a few days to report what happened at Fort Donaldson. There were a few reports that mentioned uh, unsubstantiated um, news about the fall of the fort until they finally acknowledged the defeat. It was already obvious at this point the consequences of the defeat would be for the rebellion. The victories at Forts Henry and Donaldson gave the Union control of the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, making it possible for Union ships to move as far south as Alabama, which is what you see in this illustration from Harper's Weekly. Importantly, control of the Tennessee River made it possible for the terrible Battle of Shiloh to take place just less than two months later. The immediate effect of the victory at Fort Donaldson is seen here. The Union gunboats were able to move along the river and take Nashville and Clarksville, and within days of each other, both cities fell without resistance. Nashville was the first Confederate capital to fall to Union troops and was of particular importance because of its role as a significant industrial center. 
So you can imagine how devastating this was. Brigadier Generals John McClernand, Charles Smith, and Lou Wallace were promoted to Major General. One dark mark of the victory was that despite orders to the contrary by Grant, Union soldiers looted the town of Dover, destroying all but four buildings. The Union Army controlled Fort Donaldson throughout the rest of the war, and in, later they engaged in a, the Battle of Dover in 1863. I've always liked this depiction of Grant from Harper's Weekly because I don't think it looks anything like him. Uh, but Grant really did become a superstar in the North, and he earned a new nickname. So the U.S. in his name was said to stand for unconditional surrender after the victory at Fort Donaldson. Halleck nominated Grant as a Major General of Volunteers uh, after the battle, which Secretary of War Edmund Standard supported and Lincoln, Lincoln quickly approved. Within a month, Grant was a Major General in command of what was now being called the Army of the Tennessee. Despite the victories and his promotion, Henry Halleck's dislike and jealousy of him led him to undermine him. He gave Foote and Brigadier General Charles Smith credit for the victories at Fort Henry and Hyman and criticized, and Donaldson, and criticized Grant for not following the proper protocols. He also wrote that George McClellan, wrote to George McClellan and suggested that Grant was drinking again, which was not true. Rather than allow Grant to continue the attack and chase the retreating Confederate forces under Johnston, which is what Grant wanted to do, Halleck replaced him with Brigadier General Smith as the head of the Army of the Tennessee. As I mentioned earlier, Smith was Grant's old instructor at West Point, and many originally wanted him to be in charge, but Smith was really loyal to Grant and was not looking to take credit for his success. Grant was really demoralized by this demotion, particularly because Halleck's reasons for replacing him were fabricated. Lincoln and Stanton were eventually involved, and Halleck returned Grant to command prior to the Battle of Shiloh. The surrender meant the loss of about a third of Confederate forces in the Western Theater. I think there's a statistic that shows something like the surrender, uh, Grant captured more soldiers than all previous American generals combined. The Confederate armies in Department Two were now divided with Grant's forces in between. The Union forces moved toward Nashville and Albert Sidney Johnson moved his army south to Corinth, Mississippi. As you might know, Johnston died at the Battle of Shiloh just six, six weeks later. Gideon Pillow's reputation was further sullied by his actions at Fort Donaldson, and he and John Floyd never held command again. Floyd's health failed him, and he died a year later in August 1863. The 13,500 POWs from Fort Donaldson were loaded onto steamboats and transported to Cairo, Illinois, and then to Camp Douglas in Chicago, which is what you see here. Camp Douglas was originally used to train Union regiments and was emptied and converted into a prison specifically to hold Confederate troops captured at Fort Henry and Donaldson. More than 40,000 troops passed to, through the camp. It eventually became known as the North's Andersonville. While Buckner and Tillman and other officers enjoyed liberal, rather easy conditions as prisoners at Fort Warren in Massachusetts, the enlisted men endured cramped living conditions, poor prison food, and ill treatment from prison guards. The officers were exchanged in August, and many of the enlisted men were exchanged soon after. It was fortunate that the surrender occurred prior to the cessation of prisoner exchanges following the enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation. Simon Bolivar Buckner was exchanged for Union General George A. McCall in August 1862, and he returned to the Confederate Army. In May 1865, the war coming to an end, Buckner surrendered forces under his command in New Orleans, becoming the last Confederate general to surrender an army. And you'll remember that he was the first one to do that at Fort Donaldson. And he was the only one to surrender two armies during the war. While the South was reeling with the news of defeat, civilian organizations in the North mobilized. As shown in these newspaper clippings, aid societies associated with the United States Sanitary Commission moved to aid wounded soldiers. Groups from various cities sent nurses and doctors and offered to receive soldiers in need of more assistance. The Dover Hotel, where the surrender had taken place, became an army hospital for the remainder of the war. The enslaved population of the area also felt the effects of the Union victory. 
As you can see in these newspaper articles, slavery was prevalent in and around Fort Donaldson. With the victory, Grant ordered that no self-emancipated person be returned to their enslavers, and Fort Donaldson became a safe haven for enslaved persons in the area. The 200 former slaves who were forced to help build Fort Donaldson found work as teamsters, cooks, seamstresses, laborers uh, with the Union forces who remained at the fort. In the winter of 1863, a free state or unauthorized refugee camp was established on a hill overlooking the town of Dover to provide shelter from the freezing temperatures to the former formerly enslaved refugees that were already congregating at Fort Donaldson. New research into refugee camps during the war has found that approximately 200 camps were established during the Civil War with more than 800,000 African Americans passing through them at some point. These camps became places for people to gain their freedom as well as to reunite with lost loved ones. Refugee camps had anywhere from several hundred to several thousands living in barracks and fabric tents. Dependent on the military for subsistence and safety, refugee camps were often underfed and in danger of being targeted by Confederate troops or Confederate sympathizers. These camps allowed people from different backgrounds to congregate and share ideas and traditions. The camp at Fort Donaldson provided the local enslaved population with a place to go and set precedent for other Union forts to serve in the same manner throughout the war. While the official policy of the military officials in Tennessee was that families of Black military laborers could not remain with them, officials at Fort Donaldson disliked this policy and made many exceptions to the rule. As a result, a Freedmen School was established at the camp and was very successful, enrolling over 100 students from the spring of 1862 until the end of the war. Students collected money to purchase books themselves, and in two years, people were, who were previously illiterate could recite poems and uh, written letters of correspondence with loved ones. A soldier described a scene in which a mother and a young daughter learned to read in the same class. The Fort Donaldson Free State soon became organized into a Freedmen's Bureau in the post-war period. Their property was purchased by the War Department in 1867 in an effort to preserve the land around the battlefield. Just two days after the battle, the Chicago Tribune printed the article you see here asking, quote, did they die in vain and for a worthless prize who laid down their lives at Fort Donaldson that the starry flag might float again over a reunited land? This was before the horrors six weeks later at the Battle of Shiloh where more than 23,000 total casualties uh, took place over two days, or the Battle of Antietam, which was a few months later, which had similar, similar casualties uh, in one day. In 1867, uh, a national cemetery was created on the land purchased from the Freedmen's Bureau at Fort Donaldson, and in 1928, the Fort Donaldson National Military Park was created by the War Department. Like many American battlefields, it was used as a teaching tool by the middle, military at that time. In 1933, the property was transferred to the National Park Service and was redesignated a national battlefield in 1985. What you see here is a water battery that, uh, at Fort Donaldson, where you can really get an idea of what soldier, soldiers stationed there saw when foot ships were coming up the river to attack. Here you can see the remnants of the earthworks that were constructed around the fort. The unfinished Fort Hyman, which was built across from Fort Henry, was transferred to the National Park Service uh, about 12, or about 14 years ago actually. It's in a remote area of Kentucky and it's difficult to access, but there is a new interpretive area there with historical information. And as with Fort Donaldson, the Fort Hyman earthworks are very well preserved. Unfortunately, you cannot visit Fort Henry. The Tennessee River was dammed in the 1940s, creating Kentucky Lake and submerging what was left of Fort Henry. There's a marker showing the approximate location of the fort and the Fort Henry trail system follows the route the armies took to Fort Donaldson. There are some earthworks that are still visible in the area. The Cumberland River was flooded in the 1860s, creating Lake Barkley. And today the lakes are part of the land between the lakes national recreation area. This is a map of an Fort Donaldson National Battlefield as it was a few years ago. 
and I believe they were, have been able to purchase more land to ex expand uh, their interpretation of what happened there. I encourage you to visit these smaller battlefields and historic sites that have played such an important role in our history. Some of you may have heard of the fire that destroyed much of San Gabriel Mission this morning. And whether good or bad, these sites are really significant in understanding our past. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm.